praise God. As we continue to worship the Lord, let's pray and meditate on today's scripture portion. Gracious Father, we once again thank you and praise you, Lord. We thank you because you are good. You are so gracious, even though you are Almighty God. But because of your great love for each one of us, you have humbled yourself in giving us your own dear son, Jesus, to be our sacrifice, to be our substitute, and to be our savior. We are forever grateful to your great love and mercy towards us. We confess, Lord, that we are sinful people, we are mean people, and we are proud people. Yet, you have loved us so much that you always long to set us right. You always long to work in and through our lives so that we would also become like your dear son, Jesus. We thank you for your continued ministry of sanctification amongst us. Because of your grace, because of your compassion, because of your mercy, we exist and we acknowledge that and we give you our glory, honor and praise. As we look into your word today, we pray that you would minister to us in a very special way. Let the Holy Spirit speak to each one of us and help us all to come to the understanding of your word so that we can apply it and live it to your glory. Also, I commit this time, I commit everybody, I commit the children into your loving care and I pray that you would take control of the whole situation that you would minister to us in a very special way. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, please turn it to James chapter 4. And we shall read from verses 13 through 17. James chapter 4 verses 13 through 17. Yaakko Patrika Nalgo Achayam Padmundu Nalgo Achayam Padmundu Telugu Bible Lo Ved Chustu Vante Choda Gattru Go to now, he that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas he know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that he ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now he rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The epistle of James or the book of James, which we see in the New Testament, is a wonderful epistle. This epistle is written by a man known as James. There are many Jameses in the New Testament, but this James is the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was the first bishop of the church at Jerusalem. James, when he was alive, he was nicknamed as the just man because James was so godly, he was so prayerful, and he was so compassionate, at the same time, very passionate towards the Lord and towards the kingdom of God. So. The way he lived, it was very down to earth and it was a very practical Christian way of living. That's why the book of James or the epistle of James, when you go through those five chapters, what you understand is very clear. It is a very practical book. It is a book that can be practiced by everyone that is in Christ Jesus. There is one very famous verse that we see in James chapter 2 which says, Faith without works is dead. So James happens to be a person of practical Christianity. And in chapter 4, the passage that we have read, verses 13 through 17, is talking about something which is very important, very, very vital in a believer's life. For that matter, even in a non-Christian's life also. Now, there are so many things that you can derive from that passage, but because of the time constraint and uh, because of my own condition, 
Yesterday I could bear with my jet lag, but today it is a little bit, you know, <laughs> troubling me. So I would try to keep it as brief as possible. There are three main truths that I want each one of us to see in this passage. This is a very profound passage, but I want to make it as practical as possible so that we can take the scripture and apply it to our own lives. You know, we all understand if we are Bible following Christians, that God's word is given not just to be preached, not just to be heard, but primarily the word of God is given to each one of us so that we could accept it, believe it, and then apply it to our own lives. God wants his word to be incarnate in the lives of his people. Can I have an amen, please? Amen. Jesus was our incarnate Lord. And the word of God must also become incarnate in each one of us as his disciples, as his children, and as his followers. Then we can truly glorify God. James is talking about a particular group of people that he found in his own congregation. Though this epistle was written to the 12 tribes that were scattered around in the New Testament times, especially in the first century when James was alive. But primarily he's talking about a group of people within the church of God, within the body of Christ that were not living according to the word of God. That were not according to, you know, the scripture or according to God's design for a believer's life. He is talking about people who plan their lives, who plan their businesses without taking God into consideration. Now, you need to understand something. Not, now, James is not so much against their actions, but he's against the attitude that they've had. The attitude that was behind the action which was the real culprit, the attitude of arrogance. Those people thought that they could live their life on their own. They thought that they can manage themselves. They thought that they could plan whatever they want to do in life or achieve through life. And then they could even get to that place where they could have all that they have planned for. That was, that was not the right kind of thinking and the apostle James wanted to set it right. Now before I get into the message, I want to make one thing very clear. These were materialistic people. These were the people that were found in the church, which we usually call them as worldly. You know, we always try to differentiate between the worldly and the godly. But quite often what happens is we also try to put us either in this category or in that category. But let me tell you with all humility as a true servant of God, quite often we are mistaken. Instead of putting us in the worldly category, we obviously put us in the godly category. And those that are in the godly category, we put them in the worldly category. We do it because we see some signs that are visible in their lives. And on the basis of that information, we try to categorize people. And uh, most often, many people have made a big blunder when they have done that. Let us go to the scripture and here we see the prerequisites that tell us or that show us whether we are worldly or whether we are godly. Now James is talking about that kind of people who without consulting God, they went ahead and they planned about their life. They had a plan. If you read verse 13 and 14, verses 13 and 14, you will see they were talking to themselves or as you find in Luke chapter 12, the man that was speaking unto himself, these people also, they were communing with their own selves. They were talking to their own selves and they were planning like this. Go to now, he that said, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas he know not what shall be on the morrow. Now the admonition begins in verse 14, but verse 13 reveals the mindset of the people that were within the church. James is not against setting goals. He's not against people going from one place to another place or going from one city to another city or going from one country to another country. He's not against people planning a business or, you know, considering entering into a profession or starting a work. He's not against people making money through wise means or through proper ways of earning. But he's against 
people who try to live their life independent of God. He does not endorse it. He is totally against it because from the very beginning, the Bible tells us very clearly, man was created in the image of God according to his likeness. So, man must always depend on God to fulfill God's purposes, to fulfill God's will for his life and through his life. Many a time, what happens is this. People begin their journey on their own. Isn't it true? Yes or no? And especially when you look at the young kids, the toddlers of this generation, you can easily make it out. You can easily say that they don't need anybody. They know what they want. They know how to get it. And uh, they want us to leave them alone. You know, they don't want mama, papa around. They don't want you to tell them what to do, what not to do. They want to live, like the, live their life the way they want it. And this is inherent in each and every person from the very beginning of life. And this is what mostly takes us away from God. The point that James is trying to make it here is very simple. If you don't consult God, you insult him. If you don't consult God, you insult him. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, many a time we do the same thing. We venture out into various things without taking time to pray, without taking time to read the word, to know the mind of God, without asking the Holy Spirit to guide us, without asking the men of God who have great experience in their Christian walk with Christ to guide us properly with their experience and counsel. We just get into that because it is our heart's desire to do something on our own independently. <coughs> Many professing Christians in fact don't consult God when they are planning about their education, career, when they are planning about their job, business, marriage, when they are planning to set their family or when they are planning to get into a new housing or relocation or investment etc etc. Even though this was primarily written to the believers, to the godly, even those godly men and women, they don't take the time to wait upon God and to know the mind of God. In the Old Testament, when you read certain passages of scripture, you will come across a concept which is known as waiting on God. How many of you have found it out? How many of you know about it? Waiting on God. Devudu meida veenchu onnuta. Mila yathamandik telsu. That art is lost in this generation because this is an instant generation, this is an impatient generation, this is an on-the-go generation. People don't like waiting. They want everything to be done instantly. But God is not going to change according to your likes and dislikes. God is not going to mend his ways according to the generational mindset or the generational or the cultural changes. God will remain the same all along. Can I have an amen, please? Amen. So God wants his people to wait upon him so that he would reveal his will to them. And only after knowing the will of God, they must do this or that. That is the main message that James is trying to give. The three points that I want to give to you is the first one is life is futile. Without God, life is futile. If we don't know the will of God, if we don't ask God to help us, to guide us in our life, Whatever you may do, whatever you may achieve, whatever heights you may reach to, all of that will remain futile and if you continue to live without God one day, it is going to end in great futility. The great prince of preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, when he was writing his comments on the book of James, when he came to this passage, that great man of God had this to write. And let me quote a brief passage or brief um, you know statement that he made in that great commentary that he had written years ago this is what he says is it so O oh man that thy life is self-governed is there not after all one greater than thyself is there not a higher power that can speed thee or stop thee if thou dost not know this thou hast not yet learned the first letter of the alphabet of wisdom i like that last line which is very, very powerful. He says, if thou dost not know this, thou hast not yet learned the first letter of 
the alphabet of wisdom. Without wisdom that comes from God, we cannot live life wisely. Without that wisdom that comes from God, if you try to live your life, it will end in futility. James chapter 4 verses 6 through 17, the main thing that James is trying to teach each one of us and especially to the congregation to which he had written is this, submission to God is very important. James 4, 7, it says, submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. That is verse 8. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is very important for all of us. We must submit to God in all areas of life, in all things and at all times. Only when we do that, we would make our life worthwhile and we would make our life to count for eternity or to bring glory to God or our life can become productive to the lives of people around us. <coughs> now, there are so many people, they misunderstand exactly what the point that James is trying to teach us here. He is not against planning. He is not against planning. In fact, the Bible teaches us about wise planning. There are so many scriptures which I can quote, which are actually commending planning in the right way with the right mindset. For example, let us just look at one scripture portion which is taken from Proverbs 6, 6 and 8. Proverbs chapter 6 verses 6 through 8. It says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. Now the Bible tells us to go to the ant and to learn so go, to go to the ant and consider her ways, the way she plans, the way she, you know, sees ahead and then stores food for her in the time of need. All of this is taught in the word of God. So planning is not condemned here. But planning without God is condemned here. So when you consult God and receive the right kind of plan for your life, you will be blessed by God himself with the required strength, with the required wisdom and with the required resources to implement the plan and then to get the result. That is what James is trying to convey and we all understand quite well that without a proper plan we cannot build a house, without a proper plan we cannot design a machine, without a plan we cannot implement a business, without a plan you cannot even pass a right exam today you know. Especially people who are preparing for civils in India, many people attempt but very few people get through. Why? Why? Because many people simply want to get to that level. They want the, those three letters, I, A, S, after their name. But they, they just do it without a proper plan. And some time ago I was watching national news and I don't remember this young guy's name. He was working for HSBC in Hong Kong. He was a software professional. He never intended to become an Indian administrative officer. But then suddenly after working in Hong Kong for five or six years, one day he felt I am outside of my country and I am serving a foreign corporation and my parents want me to be back home and my country needs people like me so that I can contribute to the well-being of my own country. After thinking all these things, he came back to India and he relocated himself in Gurgaon, New Delhi. Then he came to know about civils. Then he felt, if I attempt civils with a proper plan and if I clear it, then I will get into the highest position that Indian government can ever give it to me. And by being in that highest position, I think I can contribute a lot to the growth of this country and to the well-being of my society. With that, he had a plan charted out for himself and in five months time he attempted the prelims he got through and then next year he attempted the mains he got through and you will wonder to know he came first he talked because of a proper plan whereas people have been studying for civils for years but without a plan they could not achieve and we are well aware of Narendra Modi's win in the elections just few months ago. And some time back, I was watching news and I came to know that Amit Shah was made the president of BJP in India. Do you know why? 
he was rewarded for his great work in planning the right way to go to the elections. Amit Shah's only goal was to see Narendra Modi on the PM's seat and he did everything that was required to put him there. So because of his great plan or whatever, they call it great plan but I don't know. So because of that, Amit Shah was rewarded to become the president of BJP. Now God's word tells us that when we plan our life according to God's wish, when we plan our life according to God's will, it is going to be a great blessing to us. But when we do it without God's will, when we do it without God's wisdom, it will end in futility. That's the first thing that James is trying to convey to each one of us. The great architect of the world, he's a renowned world architect. His name is Frank Lloyd Wright. When he was a nine-year-old boy, he was walking along with his uncle and uh, they were walking in the snow. So both of them were walking and as they were walking, after a while, the uncle turned around and he looked at their steps and then he immediately stopped there and he called right to him and he said, just look at my steps. I have walked all along in a very straight manner, in a straight path because I know where I want to go and I have walked to reach my goal. But just look at your steps. You have been walking through the field in a crisscross manner and uh, you were not knowing where you were going. In a way, what I want to tell you is, you were simply wandering through your walk. A nine-year-old boy, right at that point in time, when he received that counsel from his uncle, he stood there and he just stayed at his steps. And then there itself, he made a decision not to walk in a crisscross manner or not to wander through life anymore. From then onwards, that nine-year-old boy set a goal before him to achieve those greater things in life. And for that, he also knew very well that he had to have a purpose. And because of that, he could become a world-renowned architect later on. My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible makes it very clear when we have God in our life, Everything that we do according to his will is going to be productive. Everything that we do according to his word is going to become fruitful. But without God in our lives, without God's counsel in our lives, everything that we do is going to end in futility. But we don't stop there. As James wants us, he says, you are not following the word of God. You are not walking according to God's will. But on the other hand, instead of humbling yourselves, you are rejoicing in your boastings. You continue to boast, you, you continue to take pride in your wisdom, you continue to take pride in your strength, you continue to take pride in your achievements, you continue to think and you continue to deceive yourself that you can manage your life on your own. That's what is wrong. We all know Proverbs 27 and verse 1 tells us, do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring forth. We are not sure what is going to happen in the next 24 hours. There is an old English proverb which goes like this. There is many a slip between the cup and the lip. How many of you have heard? There is many a slip between the cup and the lip. How true it is. You know, in my own life, I have experienced it. I am a coffee lover. Earlier I used to drink 20 cups of coffee, but because of my diabetes and my doctor's dieting plan, I am restricted to 2 to 5 cups, but I keep myself only to 3 cups a day. But so many times when I was, you know, trying to take my coffee, I got involved into something else and then it slipped and it fell onto the ground. We all know that, isn't it? Yes or no? So the statement is very true. There is many a slip between the cup and the lip. And we are not sure what is going to happen the next moment. So it is not right on our part to take boasting in the future. It is always good for any man for that matter, whether he is a Christian or not, to depend on God, to depend on his creator and to derive strength and wisdom from him so that he could live his life in a proper manner. 
Napoleon Bonaparte is a military genius. He wanted to conquer the world. But because of his mistakes, he could not achieve it. One day when he wanted to invade Russia, his friend warned him and discouraged him from doing that. He simply reminded Napoleon about an old proverb which goes like this, man proposes, God disposes. Do you know what Napoleon did? He got angry and he snapped the back. He said, I dispose as well as I propose. And then a Christian writer, when he is writing about this, he writes like this. I set that down as the turning point of Bonaparte's fortunes. God will not suffer a creature with impurity to usurp his prerogative. And sure enough, Napoleon's invasion of Russia failed and that's the beginning of his downfall. Proverbs 16 and verse 9 says like this, The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Please keep that in your mind. The mind of man, our minds plan whatever they want to achieve, but God will direct our steps. At the end of the day, all that matters is what God is going to do. What you and I plan to do or plan to achieve may never come to pass. Presumption is very foolish and dangerous. People try to live on the basis of presuming some things. We all are aware that what we plan, what we desire, what we design, what we think may never come to pass. But still, instead of coming to the Lord, we continue in that delusion. And that's what is going to make our lives miserable. How can anyone boast about tomorrow or the future? How, how can anyone boast about tomorrow or the future? Can we boast about it? But are we boasting about it? Maybe you won't open your mouth and talk about that, but through your life, through your deeds, through your thinking, through your planning, maybe, through my way of living, maybe, we are boasting. Once a traveling preacher, he was going from a place to another place and he encountered an old gypsy woman. And this gypsy woman was a fortune teller and she said, Sir, if you please give me so much of silver, I will tell you what your future would be like. And then he stopped and he said, he asked her back, he said, if I give you certain amount of silver, you are telling me that you are going to tell me what my future is like. She said, yes, sir. And then he said, I want to ask you something else. If I give you a certain amount of silver, you will tell me what I would be doing tomorrow afternoon this time. And she said, yes, sir. And then he said, I will do one more thing. Instead of this deal, I will propose you a deal and if you do that, I will give you double the amount of silver which you have asked me. She said, okay, you ask me what you want me to do and I will do it for you. He said, I will give you double the amount of silver if you can tell me what I was doing yesterday afternoon. <laughs> and she just uh, got shocked and she could not open her mouth and he said, the deal is cancelled. You know, it is very easy for many people just to imagine and then tell you what your future is going to be like. But ask them this question. Ask them to tell you what you were doing yesterday. Ask them to tell you what you were doing day before yesterday. That's why the Bible tells us that we are in no position. We do not have the power to boast about tomorrow or to boast about the future. When Paul the Apostle had written to the church at Corinth, he was trying to correct many of their mistakes. And one such mistake was about their boasting. They were boasting about various things and one of the things was this. They had great spiritual gifts. So they were cons considering themselves to be God's beloved because God had given them many spiritual gifts. And uh, in their boasting, they were going beyond the barriers that God's word has put before them. So Paul had to correct this and in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 7, he says this. I want to read it from another version and this is very clear. NASB says, for who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So everything that you have, everything that you possess is a gift from God. Everything we have has come to us from God because of His grace. 
So when we have received everything from God, how can we boast as if we have produced it, as if we have on our own achieved it or brought it into existence? So this is what is very, very important. Jesus also spoke about a rich man in Luke's Gospel chapter 12. He says, this rich man who is also known as the rich fool, he had a big land and then uh, he had a great produce. So he wanted to open up his go-downs and then he wanted to big, build big barns and then put all the produce within it and then keep it safe and secure so that he could have a lot of money and live for many years while enjoying the work of his hands. That was his plan and that was what he was trying to do. And then that night God speaks to him and he says, Oh fool, but this night your soul is required of you. He had no clue about that. His plan is to live for a long time and to enjoy his life with all the goodies that life carries. But whereas on the other hand, God was speaking to the same soul and he was saying to him that you are planning all of that. But if I do not endorse your plan, if I do not allow your plan to take place, if I cut it off in the middle, what is going to happen to you? Are you not a fool? So without God, without his counsel, life is futile. That is the first point that James is trying to make. There is an old children chant. They used to sing this while skipping. It goes like this, Doctor, Doctor, will I die? Yes, my child. Yes, my child, and so shall I. So we will all end up one day, but how is our end going to be? That is the most important. The second point that James is trying to make is, life is fragile. Just look with me at verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a, please say it out with me, it is even a V-A-P-O-U-R, vapor, avir vantidi, that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Now, the Bible uses various word pictures. God tries to communicate his truths through words, but at the same time, he uses word pictures so that we would get the exact picture of what he is trying to tell us. Now, God shows our life as a vapor. We all know what is a vapor. Yes or no? If you don't know what a vapor is, please try to think about it. And in a moment's time, it will appear in your mind's eye. You can see what a vapor is. It is like a mist. It is like a smoke. And uh, whenever you take hot coffee, hot chocolate, hot chai, the moment the cup comes before you and you place it on the table, the thing that goes up, is called vapor. It appears suddenly and it disappears suddenly. In the old manuscripts, actually, it says you. The word life is not there in the old manuscripts. The word you appears there. So James is saying, what are you? You are a vapor. What is your life? Your life is a vapor. Just imagine once we never consider our life to be a vapor. We always think that we are stalwarts. We always think that we have the power to do whatever we want. We always think that we are wise enough to achieve whatever we want. But the Bible tells us, God wants us to understand this truth that a vapor is short-lived. So our life also can be short-lived. Many times whenever the courier companies try to take something from us, it is a delicate item, they put it in a very special package. They say, fragile, handle with care. care. So God is telling you and me, your life is fragile, handle it with care. And God also tells us, because you are unable to handle it properly, I am going to be with you as your Emmanuel. I am going to be with you as your life's great counselor. So please depend on me and ask me what I need to do and I will be glad to do it. But that's a different story because most of the time we do not want to take God's help. Because we have this wrong notion in our minds. If we ask God to help, he will change our plan altogether. Because of that, we will not go to God and ask him to help us. In Russia, there is a custom. They name their children after their character traits. 
So immediately they don't name their children. They wait for one year, two years, three years, and then slowly they see what character that little fellow has or what sort of traits he possesses. Only after that they name. But there are some people who change their names after some time in life. And I can give you one example. The great Russian leader Joseph Stalin. Stalin. Stalin is the name he gave to himself. That was his not. That was not his original name. Do you know what Stalin means? Stalin means steel. So he wanted to project himself as a man of steel to the masses of Russia. He wanted to convey a message to all the Russians that you have a leader who is like steel. He's not going to go away so soon. So don't ever think of having another leader in the place of this great Stalin. You may call yourself Stalin, or you may call yourself Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Or you may call yourself as what is that other guy's name who was before him? Sylvester Rambo? Stallone. Sylvester Stallone. Mm -hmm. Sylvester Stallone. Thank you for helping me. So you may call yourself whatever. Telugu, there are so many people, they call themselves Bhimudu. <laughs> because in Hindu mythology, Bhimudu was the strongest man. So they think if their name is Bhimudu, they are really Bhimudu. But in life, they are not Vimudu. <laughs> they are not so strong as the mythological character. We can give any kind of name to ourselves, but God says you are a vapor. Your life is a vapor. We should never forget that. This will always keep us in the right place. This will always keep us at the feet of the Lord. This will always keep us as dependent people. For the first time when I went out of my country, my wife was working in a country and I had to go there and uh, when we went to the immigration office they asked us to fill certain forms, we filled them and then they said come after a week or so we went again and then they asked us to do some more procedures, we did and they called us after a month, we went and then they asked my passport, they took my passport, they told me to come in the evening, I went in the evening and they said this is your Pass. And in the past, you know what they have written? Dependent. <laughs> now you are a dependent on your wife in this country. I said, I don't have any problem. She is a dependent on me for certain things. And I am a dependent on her for a certain thing. But the most important thing is, we are all dependent on God for our life itself. We should never forget that. That is what James is trying to convey to us. You might have heard about Brandon Lee. Have you ever heard about Brandon Lee? He is the son of the famous celebrity martial arts star Bruce Lee. And whenever you hear about Bruce Lee, the first thing that comes to your mind is enter the dragon. Bruce Lee's son wanted to be like his father. He wanted to achieve the same fame, name and celebrity status. So he also trained himself in all sorts of martial arts. And then he started off as a movie actor. But he did not get the push that was required. So he acted in a few American made B grade movies and certain foreign martial arts films. But he was always trying, he was always looking forward to get the break, to get into that big <coughs> stardom status. And then one day, a major motion picture from Hollywood had come to him and they have given him the opportunity to act in one of their movies. And the movie was called as The Crow. He was given the main character in that movie and then he became very obsessed with that movie, he started training more, he started putting more workouts and then he started doing his best and he gave his best performance. After all of that, when the movie was in the making, other opportunities started coming to him. Because of his character in this movie, other people started approaching him and they were giving him more options to act. And then one day, a journalist came to interview him and as he was being interviewed, he said, very soon I will achieve my father's position. Very soon I will become a world star. Very soon I will have the celebrity status that Hollywood give only to a select few. So these were the words that Brandon Lee had communicated to that journalist. But do you know what happened? The next day on the set, a fellow actor 
when both of these were acting in a scene, a fellow actor was mistakenly handed a prop gun with a metal fragment in the barrel. And while the shot was being shot, he had to shoot Brandon Lee. And when he shot, that shot killed Brandon Lee. And that day, instantaneously on the same spot, this young film star, aspiring <coughs> film star died. His, his movies that were planned have never come into existence. Even for that matter, the movie Crow was haunted because the main character died. So Brandon Lee, nor the character that was playing in the movie, neither of, the, of them were invincible. And this tells us that anything can happen to any one of us. That's why we must always be God dependent. We must always depend ourselves upon the Lord. Everything he planned out, but the only thing that was required, he did not. He did not plan for his soul. He did not plan for his eternity. Now, before I get into my last point, let me ask you this simple question. Have you planned for your soul? Every plan that you might have planned is primarily for your body. Whether it is work, whether it is housing, whether it is good car, whether it is gadget, whether it is facility, it is primarily for your body. And secondarily, it is for your mind. When everything is available, you are, pe you are at peace. Your emotional status will remain stable. It will not go up and down like an ECG machine. But what about your soul? Have you planned about your soul? Is your soul safe and secure in the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you say, if I die today, I will straight away go into the presence of God? Can you say, my name is written in the Lamb's book of life? Can you say, if I die and I have to face my Lord Jesus, He will say, well done thou, good and faithful servant. Enter into the presence of your Lord and experience the joy of your Lord. Can it be said of you or are you still clinging on to something which is not going to give you any kind of assurance if you have to die today or the next moment? I'm sorry to use this strong language, but this is, this is the truth that we need to face one day. A man was preaching in, the serm in, in a service and uh, a young boy was trying to mock him and he said, are you ready to go into eternity? Immediately he made that statement, in five minutes time that young boy died without answering the preacher's question, without making the commitment to the preacher's question. Anything can happen to us because the Bible tells us that life is very, very fragile. There are so many verses which can tell us. But before concluding my final thought, let me tell you this. There is a sinner's dream which goes like this. Now this sinner, he is going from a place to another place and then finally in his dream he sees this. He is clinging to a rope suspended over a river. He had ventured out on the rope to escape from a tiger. Looking down, however, he could see a crocodile lurking in the river below and there gnawing at the rope was a rat. Now get this picture, this is very important. The tiger was his past which pursued him. The rope was his present situation representing a temporary reprieve. The crocodile stood for his future and the rat was time, gnawing at his life. This is the sinner's dream. Whether we believe it or not, whether we accept it or not, this is what is happening to us. Our time is going away. Life is passing away. That's why Moses, the great man of God, prayed this in Psalm 90 and verse 12. O Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Wisdom to live your life in the right way. Wisdom to make your life a vessel in the hands of God so that he could achieve his own purposes and he could achieve his own will. That's what is the most important thing. In the East, every time an emperor comes to his crowning celebration, the royal mason appears and he, after he is, you know, elevated to that great position and after he is crowned as the king, the royal mason will come to the king and he places various kinds of marble or polished stones before the king and the king has to select one of them. Do you know why? That stone has to be selected for his tombstone. On the day of his elevation, he is also 
given the opportunity to select this tombstone because it is going to tell him that you are not going to be on the chair forever. You should be willing to go whenever your call comes. The final point is this life is fertile only if it is lived according to God's will. The first point James makes is life is futile. The second point is life is fragile. And the third point is life is fertile only if it is lived according to God's will. And we should all have this mindset where we constantly say, if the Lord wills, I will live and do this or do that. Now, how many of you use the phrase God willing? How many of you use the phrase God willing? Devun chittamaite, Prabhu chittamaite, if the Lord wills. Now that has become a, what you call, a meaningless phrase nowadays. Yes or no? Every time you want to escape, you just use God willing, brother. <laughs> they invite you for a certain occasion and you say, God willing, I will be there. And you very well know you don't want to be there. <laughs> yes or no? We preachers sometimes use that. They invite us for a meeting, we say, God willing. God is willing, but this man is not willing. <laughs> That's very, very bad, but we do it. I also confess, I did it in the past. Let's look at the last verse, or verse 15. For that he ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So we must keep this in our mind, only if God wills, we will live. And only if we live, we will get the opportunity of doing this or doing that. So it all depends on God's will. So we should always acknowledge that with God's will, I will live and with God's will, I will do whatever he wants me to do. So this gives us certain truth. It speaks about our utter dependence on God. It speaks about our submission to his authority. It speaks of our humility before the almighty. It speaks of our wisdom in receiving guidance and direction from the perfect one. And that is very important for us. It speaks of our trust in His goodness and it speaks of our honor to His Lordship. Puritans of 15, 16, 17 century, they used to use this phrase in Latin. In Latin it is known as Dio Volante. They often used to use it in their speech and correspondence. And the Methodists have followed this practice for long. Every time they used to write a letter, they used to put these two letters on the letter D dot V dot. Dio Valente. The point is very simple. We cannot even live, learn or labor unless the providential will of God deems it fit. So that's how they have prepared themselves and that's how they have lived their life all along. And it is a very good practice for all believers even today to live our life like that. Alec Mortier he says like this about this in his book, he says, and I quote, We must empty our lives of proud planning, which does not fear and bow to the will of God, and submit all things to his ordering hand. Never forget God's hand orders our lives. When you bow, when you submit to his ordering hand, he will give you the best. And that is the only way of living a productive life. I love the Apostle Paul, and I constantly read his life, constantly read his ministry to encourage myself and to receive motivation from him. He is one of my favorite Bible characters in both the Testaments. And Paul quite frequently uses these words, if the Lord wills, if God wills, or if God permits. He always lived his life in the understanding that only if God wills or God permits, I would be able to do this or do that. Even after becoming a great apostle, even after Jesus using him to perform great miracles, he never went away from that concept or from that mindset. He always depended on God and lived according to his will. And it will become a, you know, mindset of every believer. So as we come to the end, let me ask you a simple question. Do you take time to pray to find out God's will concerning every issue in your life? Hello, my dear brothers and sisters. Do you take time to pray to know God's will 
concerning every issue in your life? Do you have that habit of praying and waiting on God? Or do you simply, you know, just use your common sense or use your great sense or use your wise sense, whatever sense you may have and just go ahead and do it. If every person waits upon God to know his will and does it, Christianity would have been very powerful. Christianity would have been very productive. Many people would have become Christians by now. But because we don't wait upon God to know His will, and all the time we try to do our own will, we fail. And Christianity also is getting hit by our own lifestyle and behavior. There are so many people I know in my ministry, especially in the Indian context, especially uh, God has given me this opportunity to continuously speak to thousands of young people. I love young people. And uh, praise God that He blessed our ministry among young people. Hindus, Muslims and uh, atheists, they just come to the Lord after hearing the word of God. I do not know how I connect with them, but somehow I connect with them and then they share things that they have never opened up before anybody. They would never dare to talk about those things with even their father, mother or the best friend, but they share those things with me. And um, most of them have told me the same thing. They said, we hardly find any good Christian example. They are also like us. You come with me to my university, I will show you how many Christians are doing the same things what we do. And what is the difference? Why do you want us to make... Christians or why do you expect us to become Christians? Do you expect us to become Christians so that we would also do the same thing what my own Christian friends are doing? So this example that we have failed in setting before the eyes of the heathen or unbelievers is really not only harming the body of Christ but at the same time it has become a hindrance for many people to come to Jesus Christ. So when we live our life according to God's will, when we submit to His Lordship, to His authority and live according to God's will, I believe strongly that God will use you as an example to draw many men and women unto Himself. You know, we are the representatives of Jesus Christ. You are an ambassador of Christ. You may not know, you are maybe not aware of it, but you are all royal ambassadors in America. You are not Indian ambassadors living in America. You are heaven's ambassadors living in America. Why? To represent your king. To represent your majesty. And to share his message. To get people into the kingdom of God. That is the main thing that God wants you and I to do. The rest of the things are all secondary. The primary thing we all know and we write theme songs and sing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That we are happy to put it in a song. It should be written on our soul. And it should become a practice of our life. And uh, when it becomes like that, I think any man, any woman can be used as a mighty instrument in the hands of God. The last thing that 17 verse, verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not. To him it is sin. Now James has to say much, but he is also talking about the sin of omission. The sin of omission. There are two categories of sins. The sin of commission and the sin of omission. When God forbids us to do a certain thing, and if you go on and do it, then you are committing the sin of commission. And when God bids you to do a certain thing, and you don't do it, you neglect it and you disobey, then you are committing the sin of omission. So there is a sin of commission and there is a sin of omission. Many people take pride in saying, I am not doing certain and certain things. I am not a drink, uh, I am not a drunkard or I am not taking liquor, I am not smoking, I am not a womanizer, I am not watching porn or I am not eating zarda or I am not doing this, I am not doing, I am not doing, that's very good. Because when you become a Christian, mostly that is what is expected. Yes or no? Constantly we hear this. You don't do this. You don't do this. You don't do this. You don't watch movies. You don't watch serials. You don't watch those YouTube or what you. The tube is really spoiling us. 
So most often, that's what you get to hear. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. That is one side of Christianity. But the other side, the most important thing is, do this, do this, do this, do this. What is that? Love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is where many people have failed. We are unable to love God. We are unable to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because we have never taken that to be the will for our lives. This is God's will, very clear and very convincing and very convicting. But we have not accepted that will to be the drawing or driving force behind our lives. Only when that happens, the rest will fall into its place. Let me just close with these words of late Archbishop Usher. Before he was burned at the stake, he uttered his last prayer before the Lord took him into eternity. He said, Lord, forgive my sins, especially my sins of omission. And I think we are all in this way or that way guilty before God for the sins of omission. And one of it could be that we have not given much thought or given much time to know God's will and then to put it into practice in our own lives. If that is what describes you today, I humbly ask you to submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus and then set your life right so that from now on, you will only live your life according to God's will. Then your life will become fertile. It will not end as a futile life or it will not you know, go into eternal hell when you live the way you wanted and then conduct your life according to your own whims and fancies and one day <coughs> leave this world and go away. But if you live according to God's will, your life will become fertile and it will become productive. And that's what the word of God is exhorting us this evening. Shall we bow our heads and take one or two minutes time